Hi, I'm going to be talking about a better, healthier future. Let's, let's sort of flash forward, if we will, to the year, I don't know, 2040. I have a grandson. He just turned three this year. So in 2040, he'll be something like 34. His mom and dad will be my age that I am right now, and my son will be in his 40s. Um, by that time, we'll know some things. We'll know if Gina's right, if we rallied and, and did some things to avoid the worst um, effects of climate change. But in almost all likelihood, unfortunately, in spite of the optimism, um, I think we're, our, our loved ones are going to be living in a place that's radically, radically different. Um, and that's what we want you to do. So I'm originally from Oklahoma. Are you going to click that? Thank you. There's a little animation there. You guys see it? I'm originally from Oklahoma, and I'm also an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation um, of, in Oklahoma. And the way my family got to Oklahoma, at least my, the mother's side of, my mother's side of my family, was by forced removal pro, um, policies by the U.S. federal government. They um, took, uh, oops, it's okay, just leave it. This is a time lapse of, of a heat map of the, of the world showing um, over, since from the 1800s to the present of how temperatures have changed. And it goes from blue to, to a dramatic orange and red. That's what you would have seen. So um, my family got to Oklahoma based on those forced removal policies. And they came when my great grandfather was a child and around the time that this heat map started. Uh, I also, um, as Peter said, work at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're the largest philanthropy in the United States, focused on improving the health of the over 325 million people living in the United States. And we do that work by working with all those people all across the United States to help them build a better, healthier future. And so uh, for us, that better, healthier future, future means it's a time and a place where everyone would have a fair and just opportunity to live a healthy life. Now, we call that a culture of health. Um, so, and, and, and you may have heard of that. So what, what, what could that mean? So uh, I'm a physician. I care a lot about doctors and nurses. And we, when you need a doctor and a nurse or a hospital or a clinic, you absolutely need that. But, but health, if you think about it, th and the things that go into living a healthy life, it, it takes so much more than that. It takes your job, your, where you live, your housing, the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, all of those things. And of course, um, undergirding all of that is, is, our, is our climate. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the, our large foundation that's, that's been focused on this better, healthier future. It has made the turn to start to think about, well, wait a minute. Um, what does that future look like in, in, a, change, in a rapidly changing climate? Um, and we're not there yet. We're learning. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to share some of our main messages about health and climate. And then I'll just walk you through sort of a really fast sort of bevy of, uh, of projects that we're using to help learn about that journey. So here, this is literally the official, this is like a photocopy of our, some of our messages um, about that. It's urgent. Um, it's real. It's a major threat to any um, uh, vision of a healthy future. Um, you heard a lot of the, these themes um, from the other speakers. Um, it's, it's here now. It's harming our health now. Um, uh, it's, it harms those who are most vulnerable more than others. And we'll t we're going to talk a little bit about that. There is a good, there's some, there's some important good news, though, because as we were thinking about this better, healthier future and helping communities and leaders across the United States build that better future, a lot of the things that we were talking about building those, that better, healthier future are sort of the same things that you would wanna, want them to do to build and addr to address climate change while they were doing that. Um, so um, this is this better, healthier future uh, for everyone, not just some people in some places, but everyone has a fair and just opportunity to that. We are lasered in on health equity. Everything we do is about that. Um, so our learning journey takes us to a lot of places. This is a meeting uh, last year, uh, last June, almost a year ago in Miami in Little Havana. We had an afternoon there. We were sitting in this outdoor facility. It was wonderful. Kids were playing in this beautiful culture of health infrastructure, laughing, balls bouncing. And the community leaders quietly in hushed tones told us, all of this is going underwater, all of it. And um, all of these people have to be moved. 
And so we started talking about things like managed removals, and it just sent chills down my spine, and I think the spines of everybody who was there, because like I said, my family was, my, the reason I got to Oklahoma, my whole history of, the, of, of, of my story started because of a federal removal policy. And so we know how that goes, and it doesn't go well for the most vulnerable. So climate change, it's here and now, and we're focused on it. We're looking at the challenges. And now, uh, I, I, one of the things that we have learned is that there's no silver bullet. It's going to take a zillion kinds of approaches, and that's exactly what it takes to build a better, healthier future. Um, and here are some of the projects we've supported. Uh, this is with the Climate Interactive Group. Um, they uh, looked around the world for us at uh, cities that are taking a very explicit health and climate change approach called multi-solving. And so they, did a, they found a, a large number of very interesting bright spots and they've uh, illuminated those in that report. We look at food systems and health. We look around the world for that. So this is some interesting work in Malawi um, a high, uh, captured by Generation Food. And we're sort of taking that story of that food transformation effort and all the complexity around that in villages in Malawi into Detroit and see how it transplants there. Mobility transformation. We're working with the Rocky Mountain Institute on cities trying to think about autonomous vehicles and ride-sharing technology, but how does that play as if you're thinking and planning about uh, climate change and health equity? What would you do if you were, if you were thinking that way? Uh, energy and health. Um, we're working with a group uh, looking at uh, communities in Puerto Rico and Massachusetts who are, post, who are going through post-storm transformation, both hurricanes, Sandy and Maria. What happens if you rethink your, your centralized energy grid and start to use technology to make it decentralized and much more resilient? What are the health implications of that specifically? That's what we're supporting and trying to learn about. We're um, supporting um, uh, notions about biophilia. What if we rethought the way we built our buildings or constructed our cities and made them sort of incorporate this nature um, connection mindset that Peter was talking about? What would that look like? How would that change our lives? How would that change the way we thought about climate change and ecosystems? We're also thinking about rights of nature. We have a project with the Maori Guardian. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but in 2017, New Zealand gave legal personhood status to the Wanganui River and appointed a, a human guardians for that. Our project is with the Maori Guardian, and we're doing an idea exchange between the Maori people and tribal leaders in the United States along the Colorado River to sort of see how that sort of lands here in the United States. Um, this project is our first Robert Wood Johnson health and climate public um, relations sort of uh, uh, open discussion about health and climate. We're uh, in the field right now. I was just doing a site visit and for one of the semifinalists in Minnesota in the rain and sleet and, and it wasn't sleeting, but it felt like it uh, yesterday, looking at uh, on a farm uh, on a regenerative agriculture. And we have a number of very, very interesting projects in that semifinalist. The interesting thing is, when we didn't know what we were going to get. When we put the call for proposals out late last year, um, we were looking for interventions that had been in the field for at least one year and were focused on three things, uh, improving health, addressing health equity, and addressing climate change. We thought, well, I don't know. We, may, I, who, we don't know what's going on out there. We got almost 200 proposals, and all of them were extremely interesting. And so we're down to um, a semifinalist, and we'll announce the eight that we're going to fund in the summer. So here's my call to action. You know, I'm just a guy, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm here with a, a lot, a lot, a lot of humility with these other speakers and just to work. I, I know that I personally have not done enough to address um, climate change. I'm just trying to figure out how to be a better ancestor for fu future generations. Our foundation does not have all the answers, we're, but we're in it, and we're, we're wanting to learn with you. So my, my ask is, as we think about this future that's going to be radically different, no matter what, it's going to be a changed place, um, what are your ideas for addressing that challenge, helping us being, be innovative? And then specifically for us, what's your advice to a big philanthropy and to philanthropy in general to help you do that? Thanks.